This week on CrossFeed. Southern hospitality to the extreme. Send God a voicemail. Marriage redefined. Literally. Who wrote the Dead Sea Scrolls? The Pope, condoms, and Africa. Hello, everyone, and welcome to CrossFeed Religious News. I'm Pastor Dale Critchley, Pastor St. Paul Lutheran Church in Delaware, Iowa. And I am Pastor Jim Butler out here in beautiful New England. So it's good to have everybody here and to be with you again after we were gone for a week. Uh, or Dale was gone for a week. I was around, but uh, oh well, that's, that's life. I was vacationing during Lent, no less. Yes. Not many pastors get to do that, but it just kind of worked out. So I, I switch off uh, my Wednesday services uh, with uh, another local LCMS pastor, and it was his week to do it, and so it just worked out that we were able to get away with the family a little bit. So nice time. had been having a nice, relaxing week. Good. I'm. Uh, I've been working and working and keep on working. So that's my life. We'll, we'll, we'll be on vacation when I retire. Anyway, <laughs> but you know, I don't know. Where should we begin tonight? Um, you know, I tell you, Dale. One of my problems I have as a pastor. I don't know about you. Is finding the time to pray. You know, yeah. I get so busy doing my work and, you know, preparing the Bible study, preparing the sermon, you know, visiting people uh, and trying to do my own, you know, getting a regular exercise. I just have time to pray. And now I don't have to anymore. Yeah, this is so convenient. Right, this I, can, is... I can have a computer pray for me. <laughs> right. This is... Um... Uh, a friend of mine sent me this uh, a link to this. Uh, in fact, he is uh, agnostic, and he sent me this and said, "What is this?" <laughs> you know? And uh, and so I thought this is just so ridiculously fascinating that I it, it's not a news article; it's just a website, but it sort of speaks for itself. It's called Information Age Prayer, and if you really want to, you can find it at inf informationageprayer.com. Right. And here's the basic idea. Because you don't have time to pray, right? you can purchase prayers to be said for you using text-to-speech technology. So basically, you pay this company... And then they have their computers, supposedly, I mean, there's really no way to actually verify this, um, even if you wanted to, um, but they have their computers speaking these prayers, and they'll, they'll put your name in the blank or, or whoever it is you want to pray for, and, um, and you can pay for a subscription, it'll do it every day for a month, um, and, uh, and, and so it'll do these prayers. And uh, so this is sort of like, you know, when you... Um, when, when when the phone rings and you answer it and it's a recorded message telling you about some great new offer or something like that, right? This is doing that to God. <laughs> yes. Yes, it's uh, each prayer is voiced individually with the name of the subscriber displayed on the screen. Doesn't even say it even says your name. Your name's just displayed on the screen. So God, I hope you can read it. And you can get Protestant prayers, Catholic prayers. Jewish prayers, Muslim prayers, and even the unaffiliated prayers, or as they say in the military, no religious preference. <laughs> yeah, I like that one. The sort of like, whoever you are out there, if you're listening, what kind of a god are you that you're listening to this computer speak on my behalf? <laughs> you know, you know this, this is the high tech version of the Hindu prayer wheel. Okay. You know, the Hindu prayer wheel is, you, you know, you, you, you spin it around, and every time the prayer goes around, you know, you, it goes around once you set the prayer. So this is a high-tech version of it. It's all it is. So do you get, like, bonus blessings if it lands right on the dollar? I don't know. <laughs> but, uh, 
You know, but, no, I mean, I just look at this. I mean, this is, this is, I don't know what this is. Hey, man, um, this don't feel right. My donkey senses are tingling all over. You know, it's, it's, it's not Christian prayer. Christian prayer is all about a relationship with God. Right. Yeah, you know, that's, that, a, that's exactly it. Now, now think about this. Okay. If you had the president's phone number, you know, and, and he would actually answer it and, and, you know, be willing to talk to you. And, and had time to do so, all right? Would you call him with a recorded message? You know, I know there's plenty. Depends of if I want to tell say, him though. something. Yeah. So okay. So all right. You've got the listening ear of the God of the universe. All right. Are you going to give him a recorded message, or are you going to tell him what's on your mind? <sighs> And what is it Jesus talks about in, in, in Matthew? You know, don't pray like the pagans. They think they'll be heard because of their many words. You know, literally babbling. You know, that's what you're doing here. You're babbling. Yeah. This is the many words. This is just empty words. And hoping God's going to hear me because I use all these empty words and phrases. And um, I just, this is, this is, this is sad. This is, you know, I would hope no Christian person, because really, prayer, it's not about the words. Prayer is all about the relationship we have with God. Yeah, that's why he lets us call him Father. Right. You know, it's it's a tremendous honor, you know. But he says, like, I want you to talk to me. You know, I want to have this relationship with you. You know, I love you. I care about you. I mean, I'm just imagining, you know, if my kids came home from school and I said, Oh, you know, how was your day today? <laughs> and they like hit a little button on their, you know, iPod speakers or whatever, and it plays back some recorded message. Like, um, yeah, okay. So, how was your day today? <laughs> you know, I mean, it's it's all about hey, I I care about you, and I want to talk to you, and I want to, you know, I want to I want to hear from your heart, you know. So this is it's like this is the like an incantation kind of thing, yeah. You know, it's like how to pray and get what you want. You you don't have any high school kids in your house. Hi there. Hi. How was your day? Fine. What did you do at school? Nothing. <laughs> you know. I mean, you know. <laughs> I I would like to have the iPod touch to text to speak. Mm-hmm. Then you know, at least I gotten some That'd conversation out of them. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but no, seriously. Um, yeah, it's this is this is not prayer. It, you know, yeah, you talked about uh, God. You know, uh, wanting to have a relationship. You know, isn't that Luther's explanation to to our Father? He invites us tenderly to come to Him as a dear Father welcomes His dear children. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, yeah. Good, good story. Good story. Uh, where should we go to next? Um, <laughs> Nowhere to go but up. That's for sure. <laughs> Um, oh, let's, uh, I don't know. We got our, I, I'm, I'm kind of, um, I, I have to apologize that our stories, it, and this just worked out this week that, that we have three stories that relate to sex in some way. So I, so let's do the other well, let's one do, that's not. Yeah. Let's do, yeah. Let's do the scholar here. Yes. Um, so then this British, um, uh, Hebrew scholar of uh, actually the the Jew, teaches Jewish mysticism at the Hebrew University. Her name is uh, Rachel Elior, and she argues that the um, it's you know we've always said that there's this group out in the um, uh, desert Quran community uh, called the Essenes, and they were the ones who created the Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, and then they died off, and we found the Dead Sea, you know, until we found the Dead Sea Scrolls. Um, and the Jewish Roman historian Flavius Josephus talks about them. And, well, she argues they never existed. Um, that instead, uh, you know, he he made them up. He made up this community uh, to say that they were, you know, g- you know, great Jews of, of uh, devotion and heroism. Uh, because uh, the Jews, to the Romans, the Jews were the people who had rebelled against Rome, and so they were a bunch of losers and traitors. Um, yeah, inspired by the Spartans. 
Yes. All right. And so here's her um, rationale for saying that they never existed. If you read the Dead Sea Scrolls, they never mention themselves by this name. And so, therefore, they must not exist. Oh, good grief. All right. So, um, this is sort of like saying, well, in the book of John, the Gospel of John, John never mentions himself by name. Uh, he always uh, refers to himself as the disciple whom Jesus loved. And, I mean, he includes himself in the list of, um, of, uh, of, what's the word, apostles, disciples. Um, but he, I mean, he doesn't, um, well, maybe in the introduction, but, all right. So, because they don't talk about themselves, or at least use that name for themselves, um, somehow that's, uh, you know, they, they must not have existed, even though they do refer to themselves as the men of holiness or sons of light or something like that. You know, the early Christians didn't call themselves Christians. That name was attached to them. Uh, they referred to themselves as uh, the followers of the way. And um, right. so, so this whole thing is an argument from silence. Right. She argues that they were renegade sons of Zadok, a priestly caste banished from the temple of Jerusalem uh, by Greek rulers in the second century BC. Of course, actually, the sons of Zadok became the Sadducees. Right. The Sadducees became the Lord of Zadok there. Um, you know, and they took these scrolls with them. Um, and uh, it's kind of interesting, actually, because, um, uh, you know, uh, because you see, it's not, not only is it in uh, um, Josephus, but also uh, Philo, Pliny the Elder, also talk about them. But she's like, oh, they just they just borrow from each other, you know. They they just quote each other. Uh, she says, you know, uh, you know, Pliny the Elder describes the Essenes as choosing the company of date palms. Okay, um, and he was a great reader, but he probably never visited Israel. But the fact is, though, he did hear. That they existed. Okay, maybe he never visited Israel, but he knew that the, he knew this community was out there. Mm -hmm. You know, you know. So, uh, and I and I and uh, um, you know, she she you know says usually my opponents have only read Josephus and other classical references to the Essenes. They should read the Dead Sea Scrolls, all thirty nine volumes. The proof is there. Well, yeah, that's true. But you know what, Josephus. <laughs> You know, has been regarded as a, a pretty accurate historian yep. overall. Uh, his stories of Herod are accurate. His, uh, you know, a lot of his history is very accurate. Why wouldn't he be accurate in this section? Yeah, yeah. He's accurate throughout, except he just, like, made up this, you know, group of, of people that and, and just stuck them in there for no particular reason. I don't know. I, You know, the funny thing is, though, that you know she's making this big argument and ultimately it's not going to um it, it you know it might make time magazine or whatever but or uh, yahoo news in this case but ultimately it doesn't really matter i mean because the bible never mentions uh the essenes and um you know uh, jesus never talked about them you know the, nowhere are they referenced the only reason that we know about them is from these other writings mostly josephus and so, you know, whether they existed or not, or, or I mean, I don't really understand this reference to the uh, to the sons of Zadok, because like Jim said, those are the Sadducees. Uh, we know about them. Um, but, uh, you know, it, it doesn't affect the Bible at all. I mean, no. whatsoever. The Dead Sea Scrolls are great because they're written um, around uh, 200 B.C., those are, are a good demonstration of biblical authority that we can see um, from, you know, second century BC. And, um, and then we go, the next oldest ones, uh, copies of the Old Testament are from ninth century AD. And we can compare them and say, wow, they didn't really change a whole lot. You know, it's amazing that even though these have been copied and transmitted over the ages, that they've been kept pretty much the same. 
and uh and it just shows how um you know we say you know the bible it's the word of god and god preserves his word for us and we can say yeah wow it's you know the the differences are just uh these sort of minor negligible um uh, mostly kind of grammatical things um that that don't really that, you know that don't have any impact really and so you know whether this group you know whether it was the the Essenes or you know or or, or somebody else um it doesn't really matter so i mean i <laughs> i'm i'm thinking that um okay we're we're getting close to um to easter and time in newsweek or either time or newsweek usually it's one or the other um all right, we'll come out with uh, some sort of um, basically trying to disprove the Bible. For some reason, Christmas and Easter, they always do that. Um, you know, it sells papers. So uh, if this is the best they can do, uh, they're going to have to work on it because this, this does nothing to the Bible whatsoever. Right. Well, you know, yeah, Josephus tells us so much, um, but... You know, I don't know why. You know, this king. She thinks she's 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 inaccurate. She she's a lone voice here. But you know, every brilliant person has to have some weird idea. So I won't tell you mine right now. But you know, I'm sure I have them. Suggesting that you're brilliant. brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> so speaking yeah. of weird so, ideas. Okay. Um let's uh let's go to rural Alabama. This actually isn't such a weird idea in that it's been done. We've talked it, about it, it on the show. It's been done ad, ad nauseum. Um and uh I'm this getting a little, a little actually different. tired about it. But uh it's a rural Alabama church uh Coleman County, Alabama, and they're doing a month. Day Star Church, and they're doing a month long focus on sex, including billboards that says "Great Sex, God's Way," which, by the way, happens to be male. It shows a man and a woman. So, just in case you're wondering, and the woman, uh, and they're like dressed in wedding clothes. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> and. Uh, you know, okay, fine. Um, well, I don't know what got me. One of the, you know, it, it's it's riling at people, and the guy says, "Absolutely, we wanted to shock people." Now, I don't know. I mean, I'm I'm not dealing with the idea. You know, let's let's go out and shock people. Um, I we, I just had a board of Christian education meeting, and we got to talking about. I'm going to do a class this summer for parents on issues of adolescence this fall. Uh, and I'm calling it surviving, ad, you know, surviving Your Kid's Adolescence from a parent who's done it four times. Mm-hmm. So, uh, you know, and how do we go through it? But you know, that was one of the issues we were talking about is, you know, what, what is appropriate for kids to watch? How do you draw those lines? And, you know, how do you encourage your kids into areas of purity when we live in a world that does not? I mean, those are very important issues. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, you know, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm tired of the churches, you know, throwing it out in people's face, just kind of almost as, you know, shock value. You know, I was having an interesting discussion um, with, uh, we mentioned it before, the guys over at uh, geeksandgod.com. Um, and we were talking about, they, they did a show on um, church marketing. And, um, you know, and, and they asked a question I thought was a really good question. You know, marketing by definition is all about selling. All right. Mm-hmm. Are we trying to sell Jesus or sell the Bible or are we trying to build relationships with people? Right. Cause this is to me, this is selling. This is, Oh, get people's attention and shock them and, and, and whoa, what's going on? And you know, and and I imagine the idea is that people are going to look into this and go, oh, what you know, what's this all about? You know, the problem is you're going to turn off as many people as you're going to get attention. You know, people are going to see that they're going to be offended by it, especially in Alabama. You know, I mean, it's not like this is in uh, 
in Los Angeles or something, you know? And so I'm looking at this and going, you're, you, if, I mean, if you're trying to sell, <laughs> this is going to turn people away. Right. Um, I'm not so negative on the idea of church marketing. I mean, you're not trying to sell Jesus. You're trying to sell your congregation. Basically, you're trying to get them in the door so you can share the gospel with them. Um, you know, I mean, churches do, you know, these, these, um, like a zip code mailing for Easter. Sure. Um, I'm, you know, uh, and that kind of stuff. Or there's some other things, you know, on the same time, you get, you, you can't go into the Wittenberg Doors old truth is stranger than fiction section where, you know, the pastor will preach from the, the roof of the church if he gets, you know, you know, 500 people on a Sunday morning or something like that. Or, you know, you know, or you know, you know, the Sunday school director will kiss a pig if we get three hundred kids in Sunday school. You know, okay, now we're in the silly territory. Right. Um, you know, I mean, I mean, on the one hand, I, I I argue with him that the church needs to be out in front of a topic like this. On the other hand, you know, when Paul talks about issues of sexuality, he does it to the church, not to the world. Yeah, the world's not going to understand this. You know, he didn't start with that topic. He started with the gospel. And then he brought people, then once they're in God's kingdom, then he dealt with them, okay, what does God expect of you? So, you know, they, they have this, this Ron Bulu, who's a, a trucker who preaches at truck stops. You know, what a, what a guy to quote. Uh, but he says, you know, Paul said, preach the gospel. Talking about sex ain't going to get nobody to heaven. Um, you know what? I hate to say it. He's, he's right. You know, preach the gospel. Focus on what does God want us to learn. Um, because otherwise, you know, you, you get into this one or the pure sex thing, the, the series, the only thing you're going to do is bring them in and say, you know, here's what, here is God's ideal for marriage, A, B, C, D, and E, which is basically going to be the law. Mm-hmm. Right. So after doing that, the only thing you can say is, but of course you you messed all that up. But Jesus did die for you. I mean, you almost got to shoehorn the gospel in there. Yep. Yeah. Now we talked about this was last week. Um, or well, it wouldn't be last week, two weeks ago. Um, that really, you know, this is all. You find this all in Ephesians five. All right. And and really, you know, if you understand Ephesians five, um, and and can relate it to the gospel, and talk about God's love for us and. Um, and the relationship, getting back to what we were talking about before about relationships, that God wants to be in a closer relationship with us than we have with our spouses. Um, you know, my wife gets a kick out of out of telling my kids that um, that I'm the uh, number two man in her life because Jesus is number one, and um, you know, and and they kind of huh? you know and um. So, but you know they understand that, and so I'm gonna marry that man. The problem is, if you don't understand Jesus first, you know, if you don't understand the gospel, and the other thing is, I'm I'm looking at um, I, I looked at the, they had at this story they've got a YouTube video, and I'm not gonna um stick it in our feed or anything, but um, if you watch the video, if you go to the story, he's got this interview with the devil. All right, this guy with the red suit with little flames and the you know the horns and stuff, and um, and he's talking about how you know basically God invented sex, but then the um, the devil has kind of twisted it and changed it and gotten rid of the whole one man one woman thing and and all that stuff, and and I'm, so I'm you know I'm watching this video and it's like four and a half minutes long, and they never actually get around to talking about Jesus. All right, the problem is somebody's going to find this on YouTube, which is where it's actually hosted, okay? And they're going to watch this, and they're going to go, okay, so these people are pro-traditional marriage, okay? But it hasn't, they never mentioned Jesus. And the only way that God has ever mentioned is as the creator of sex. And I'm sorry, but God's a whole lot more than that. And if you don't understand who God is, and who Jesus is, and how he loves us, then this whole discussion is going to make no sense to you. And so if you're going to put a, you know, if you're going to put a, a, bull, a billboard up on the side of the road that's, that's talking about that, all right, 
how about something like, um, you know, in, in, and you'd have to shorten this up, you know, but just off the top of my head, something like, you know, society has the shallow view of sex, but God's view of it, uh, something about, you know, that's, he wants to be in that close of a relationship with us, or, you know, or something like that. Um, you know, it's just, I think before you, you talk about, even talk about societies or, or God's understanding of sex, you've got to talk about love first and what is love, right? And that love is all about sacrifice and, and the sacrifice that God made for us. And then we in turn love each other because he first loved us. And we take that expression of love to each other. And, um, so I, you know, I, I mean, unless you understand that, none of this stuff really means anything. Oh, very nice, Ben. That's for sure. Oh, let's talk about the Pope. Let's let's deal with stuff taken out of context here. Um, I want to move over this this this. Okay, because this one out this one out over Associated Press. You saw this everywhere. And it was aboard the papal plane. Uh, Pope Den- Benedict the Sixteenth said Tuesday that distribution of condoms is not the answer to the fight of AIDS in Africa. Um, you can't resolve it with the distribution of condoms, the Pope told reporters. On um, on the contrary, it increases the problem. Um, some priests and nuns working with the victims of AIDS pandemic raging in Africa question the church's opposition to condoms. Okay, so here we have stupid Pope once again. You know, stupid Pope doesn't know what he's talking about. Stupid Pope doesn't know uh, there's people dying. Stupid Pope doesn't care. Stupid fat troubles. We have stupid Pope again. This is his actual quote. I'm waiting! I would say that the problem of AIDS cannot be overcome with advertising slogans. If the soul is lacking, if Africans do not help one another, the scourge cannot be resolved by distributing condoms. Quite the contrary, we risk worsening the problem. The solution can only come through a twofold commitment. Firstly, the humanization of sexuality, and secondly, true friendship above all those with whom our suffering are readiness, even through personal sacrifice to be present with those who suffer. Impressive. Yeah, but that's not just a little sound bite, you know? That's not going to sell papers. I mean, he's absolutely right. Yeah, absolutely. You know? It's never enough to change behavior. You've got, or, or effect, you've got to change the heart. Mm-hmm. Here's the problem that's that's causing this AIDS epidemic in Africa. Okay, in and and I've talked to a uh, he's actually a refugee from Ethiopia that explained this to me. Um, it is popular, or it is um, a, a real men are not faithful to their wives. The measure of a man there is determined by, uh, and I'm not saying everywhere in Africa, but where this AIDS epidemic is is being such a problem. All right, the measure of a man is how many women he has, regardless whether he's married. Okay, so these guys are going from woman to woman to woman. All right, since AIDS is pretty prevalent, it's pretty decent chance he's going to pick it up somewhere because. You know, any given woman Mm -hmm. has had multiple partners because of this, right? And so it's spreading like crazy, right? Handing out condoms isn't going to help, right? It might help a little bit, but... Well, it goes back to what the Pope said. It's a dehumanization of sexuality. Right. It's it's not treating them as women. It's treating them literally as notches on the bedpost who has the most notches wins. Right. Yeah. It's horrible. And the thing that I don't understand is why is our why is our society and our um our, our, our charitable organizations, you know, UNICEF and all these other groups, 
Why are they so intent on, oh, well, we'll just hand out condoms. All right, you know what? That is the lazy, easy approach, all right? That is, well, we're doing something, right? All right, you're not doing any good, mm-hmm. all right? The, 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 the work that you're doing could be so much better used elsewhere, all right? Because the reality is that these people need much more help than that, all right? And you can't just throw some condoms at them and say, here you go, here's the solution to your problem. Right, because the other thing is, that's not a um, you know, real men don't use those either. If they respected the women enough to use them, they'd respect them enough to stay faithful to their spouses, to their wives. Well, it, goes, it goes back to what the Pope was saying. If the soul is lacking, in other words, there needs to be a renewal of the heart, and that's what the gospel does. It renews the heart, and. You know, I think, you know, but again, like we said, this, you know, to, to really talk about what he's talking about here, that, you know, it's the renewal of, of the personhood of the person, not just merely a, a, um, a behavioral thing or a medical thing, uh, but a spiritual matter. That's not going to sell papers. No. No, it's much easier to say Pope says they're bad. Pope says they increase the thing. Dumb old Pope. Doesn't know what he's talking about. You know, well, actually he does. You know, if you read this in context, it's a very significant, actually, and there are a number of people who, who work with AIDS people over in, in Africa who agreed with him. You know, because, uh, you know, this is almost like saying, you know, you know, we're dealing with alcoholics. There's a real problem with alcoholism. We need to teach them to drink safely. You know, instead of dealing with the heart issues that are causing them this behavior. Yeah. You know, and and, and an issue that says your manhood is judged by the number of notches on the bedpost. You know, this is a perfect tie-in with our previous story. I mean, these two things relate. And in mm-hmm. fact, this is, a, this is a good example of why you can't just <clears throat> talk about sex. All right. You've got to talk about Jesus. All right. Because it's in Christ that we have value as human beings. You know, oh, here's someone, you know, this woman that you're married to is so valuable that God was willing to give up his son to pay for her life. All right. And if she is that valuable to God, who are you to devalue her or any other woman? All right. God kept his vows to you, even when it meant going to the death for you. All right? How can you not keep your vows to your wife? I'm going to marry that man. Absolutely. So that was, um, but yeah, that story, when I, when I read the full quote, I was really, really irritated because it's, again, just ripping something out of context. Um, Earlier, you, you you mentioned that your wife thinks you're the number two man in her life. Well, her life and the kids, your kids look at you kind of funny when she looks at her kind of funny. I was like, well, that's better than you saying, well, God's the number two man in my life, uh, or number one, or whatever. You know? <laughs> I, I thought about asking, well, who's the number two man in your life, Dale? You know, but uh, uh, but we won't go there. But. Um, <laughs> But Merriam-Webster Dictionary, which is published in my old hometown of Springfield, Massachusetts, did. And I don't know why this even makes the news. I think it's kind of almost a silly thing um, that it says uh, Merriam-Webster, um, you know, uses the term. Uh, it talks about same-sex marriage. Um, you know, it said uh, the state of being united to a person of the opposite sex as a husband and wife in a consensual and contractual relationship recognized by law. That's the first definition of marriage. But it also says uh, the state of being united to a person of the same sex in a relationship like that of a traditional marriage. Uh, and they're like, well, this is what people, this is how it's used. You know, you turn on the news, people say the term same sex marriage. Uh, I may not like it, you may not like it. But that's the that's the phrase that's used, and they're just like, okay, we're just trying to give accurate information. But somebody's trying to make it a big deal. Uh, World Net Daily uh, said, you know, uh, 
you know, one of the nation's most prominent dictionary companies that resolved the argument over whether the term marriage should apply to same-sex duos or be reserved for the institution that's held families together for millennia by simply writing a new definition. You know, I, mean, I, can, it's, it's, it's a, I have mixed feelings about this one, right? I mean, just a, a, even if you look at the, the, the definition, um, like that of a traditional marriage, Right. I mean, I suppose in in uh, Connecticut and Massachusetts, there is such a thing as you know, a same sex marriage. Right. At the same time, and soon to be uh, Vermont. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> that's that's your neck of the woods, dude. <laughs> now, my neck of the woods, Massachusetts and Connecticut. Yeah. And yeah. OK, Vermont, where Ben and Jerry's is, which has like, excellent ice cream. <laughs> Yeah, and uh, Small Dog Electronics is up there too. Mac. Company. That's right. Yeah, yeah. yeah so, but they're uh, they're they're a they're a very agnostic group, as I or something like that, as I've been told. Although, uh, uh, as we know, though Vermont and Connecticut and Massachusetts are three of the most secular states in the country, as we yep. talked about earlier. Yep. You know, so still think Massachusetts would be number one. But anyway, um, go ahead. Merriam-Webster says, "Well." Pfft. You know, we're we're kind of late to the game on this. Houghton Mifflin did the uh, changed it in 2000, and the um, Oxford English Dictionary also changed theirs a while back. Um, so Houghton Mifflin does the American Heritage Dictionary, and uh, in 2000 they changed it to a union between two persons having the customary but usually not the legal force of a marriage, a same-sex marriage, right? Um, which I don't understand the word custom. I mean. I, it doesn't seem customary to me. It's like it's traditional, but not traditional. Um, and then, uh, and then, and then you have the the Oxford English Dictionary: a long term relationships between partners of the same sex. And that one I thought was really inaccurate. Um, because that the term sometimes refers to. Yeah, but marriage sometimes. Refers- that's not marriage. See, I mean, I mean, well, it's that's I, not what, what if you if you have you know heterosexual people in a long term monogamous relationship. Okay, if they're living together and you know there's the whole common law marriage thing. Okay, but but no one calls that marriage unless you're talking like common law marriage. Okay, if if they're not, you know, so it just it seemed like a very inaccurate definition. Well, but yeah, it probably isn't the best. Of course, we've kind of almost gotten away from the common law idea here in the United States uh, now. But also, one time it was fairly common. Uh, I did read people, you know, who did just move in and, and introduce one another as husband and wife. Although sometimes you get some of these uh, older, you know, po- you know, social security couples, and they, you know, you know, to go through the legal marriage, they lose the uh, benefits and stuff, and so. Um, you know, so they will um, begin, you know, relationship. And they'll call each other husband and wife. You know, but you know, and and consider themselves married, but it's not a, a you know legal force. So yeah, it's not traditional, but it can be. But I mean, you know, it's, the question is, is you know, it, should this be a? Um, I mean, I wish we could come up with another term, but I can't think what. It, but you know, I mean. Unless you want to talk about civil unions, um, <laughs> that that uh, bill we talked about last time, but in California, we're just going to get rid of the word marriage altogether, <laughs> right? You know, yeah, you know, trying trying that. I mean, we're, we're stuck. I mean, you know, even you and I on the show talk about you know objections to same sex marriage. You know, and I guess then you know you can you know put the word marriage in quotes like they you know I think it's the Fox News does that traditionally they say you know. Same sex quote marriage end quote, but what else you're gonna what else you're gonna call it? Yeah, well, I mean, when you're when you're trying to when you're trying to establish that there is such a thing, you know, you're gonna talk about it and use that term, and so yeah, there's real there's no way of getting around it. I I don't know. I guess I look at it and I say, well, okay, the fact that we say same sex marriage sort of implies that this is not what you normally think of. As marriage, you know, um, right. 
I've never heard anybody say ever talk about opposite sex marriage. Right, right, right. So yeah, marriage is inherently um, heterosexual, right? Um, and so to you know, I don't know. I I guess at the at the same time, I also look at it and say, you know, this is how society uses the term. Um, and because society uses the term that way. You know, to see it in a dictionary, I guess it, it's it's in a, in a sense it's it's a commentary on our society that that term does appear in the dictionary. I mean, let's face it, there's all kinds of stuff in the dictionary that we'd rather didn't exist, but it does. Um, and uh, so yeah, you know, you're not really uh, concentrate, Pinky, uh, concentrate. It, it, it's not like the, by the dictionary doing this, all of a sudden people can go, oh, see, it says in the dictionary, you know, <laughs> like I can use it in Scrabble. So therefore it's reality, you know, <laughs> and it's, and it's, you know, it's just and right and, and all that kind of stuff. Right. So I don't know. This is, you know, this issue, it, it, it keeps coming up. We, you know, keep hitting it again and again and, and just because of all the different angles and approaches to it and everything. And, um, it, this is something that, you know, that we're dealing with as a society and, and a lot of people try to make it into a real cut and dried thing, but it's, it's not, I mean, there's a lot of angles to it. Um, you know, we've talked about what the Bible says and, and again, you know, go back to Ephesians five, if, um, that, you know, according to the Bible, you, you just can't have, um, you know, same sex marriage by God's definition. And, um, it just, it, it, it destroys everything that God wants for us in, in understanding our relationship with him. Um, but you know, at the same time, no, let's, let's be honest as Christians, we need to be sensitive to those who find themselves with these sort of preferences and, and, um, and are trying to deal with them. All right. And, you know, we can't just like go up and, and sort of take the Westboro Baptist approach and say, God hates you, you know, um, you know, we've got to be sensitive to people and, and, and recognize that this for them is a, is a very important and very real thing. And, and, you know, that just like condoms in Africa, sometimes there's not just easy answers where, you know, we can just get in people's faces and, and say, well, this is the way it is. And if you don't like it, you know, don't let the door hit you on the way out. Well, I think we always remember what Paul says in First Corinthians 6, and he goes through this whole list of people who, who you know, can't get to heaven. Thieves, idolaters, uh, homosexual offenders, um, and he uses a whole bunch of other words. And, yeah, it's some debate exactly how you translate that word, although the one word literally means men who – have sex with other men so i don't see how else you can you know it's pretty graphic term in the greek but uh, but then he goes you know and that is what some of you were but you are washed you are justified you are purified in christ jesus in other words you know it's it doesn't end with the condemnation we are about the gospel we're about the hope of christ jesus the new beginning people can have And we are about rescuing them from their sin. Yeah. Yeah. Which means, you know, first you got to call sin a sin. Um, you know, otherwise you don't need Jesus, you know? Um, and so, yeah, we do have to stand up and say, you know what? This is, this is not right. All right. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it's, it's sort of like with prayer, um, coming full circle, right? When, when God answers prayer, he answers in one of three ways. Either he's, if, you know, if we ask him for something, he either says, yes, you know, here you go. Uh, or he says, yes, uh, you got to wait for it. Or he says, um, no, I've got something better for you. All right. And when it comes to, um, to homosexual relationships and, and gay marriage or whatever you want to call it, God says, no, I have something better for you. All right. That doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be easy. And God never promises easy for us. Uh, quite the contrary. Uh, he says you're going to have trouble and, and you're going to be persecuted and you're going to have all kinds of problems. All right. 
but he promises to be with us and he's going to work through those problems. And you know, something that keeps striking me about God, um, that is, is, that just constantly leaves me astonished is how he can take a bad situation and turn it into something good. How he can take something that has no good in it inherently and then change it to bring out good where there was no good. And, you know, so how, how can God use a a situation, um, you know, where you're talking about gay marriage and and the breakdown of, of marriage in the, um, in, in the world, really, um, you know, I, I don't know, but God is bigger than our sin. You know, he proved that by paying for all of it on the cross. And so, you know, how is he going to use this? Um, you know, I don't know. I don't know, but, uh, I'm looking forward to it because I do trust that, um, that God is going to be able to take these sort of situations, not only on a sort of global scale, but on in individual lives as well. And, um, so, you know, I'm, I'm constantly astonished by, I don't know why it surprises me because, you know, I should just go, well, yeah, that, you know, that's classic God, you know, I would expect that, but, you know, I think it, it comes down to, he is so much wiser than we are that, you know, we can look at a situation and go, I have no idea how any good is going to come out of this. And then, you know, it just, just the thought of any good coming out of it, we go, no, this, this is no way. And then all of a sudden, something completely unexpected that, you know, you couldn't have dreamed up in a million years, you know, boom, there it is. And you go, oh, wow, you know, and, you know, sometimes, sometimes there's things that we don't see the good that comes out of it um, because it's, it's not uh, a direct result. You know, sometimes it, it affects people's hearts. Uh, sometimes it's, it's something that happens here that, you know, that ends up having a positive effect somewhere else that you never see. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm looking forward to, to going to heaven and, and, and seeing, um, you know, being able to, to talk to God and say, all right, you know, show me this one. And I, and I think of, I'm just going to like spend the first million years just astonished, um, by all of the amazing, um, ways that God is, is working that, that we just completely don't understand. So, but he does because he loves us. Mm-hmm. Are you incapable of restraining yourself, or do you take pride in being an insufferable so, know-it-all? What else is there to say but amen? <laughs> Except if you have a comment, you can always contact us at podcast at crossfitdues dot com. So, um, no, but I can't top what Dale said. He did a nice job. Yep, that's because so. I'm brilliant but quirky. Hey, <laughs> that's my brilliant. But I'm quirky but brilliant. But anyway, so <laughs> flashes, flashes. Anyway, so anyhow, um, comments, please send them to uh, uh, podcast at crossfeednews dot com. Yep, and a reminder Again, if you're watching this on uh, YouTube or Rever or one of the other. Uh, uh, sharing sites. Um, if you're interested in watching a higher quality uh, video, uh, you can get our podcast and uh, you can go to uh, crossfeednews.com slash podcast and get all the information there, or you can just watch it right there um, in higher quality. Mm-hmm. So thank you everybody and good night and God bless. Good night. God bless. God bless.